Okay, so this is your module nine review. We're going to look at legal and ethical issues of aging, and this also includes the economics of aging. Healthcare is a major concern in the United States, and it is expensive. Health insurance does pay for a lot of that, so some people are not completely aware of the cost. But the older adult, you know, as they begin to age, they lose the benefits of health insurance because they're no longer working. So Medicare was established to help provide health care funding for older adults and those with disabilities. And most adults will qualify for Medicare at age 65. There's four distinct programs within Medicare. We've got the Part A, which uh, includes the hospital insurance. It covers hospitalization, skilled nursing, home health services, and hospice services. The Part B is the medical insurance that covers the 80% of the customary and usual rate that's charged by providers. However, a lot of older adults are going to have some supplemental insurance to help cover costs that are not covered by Medicare, which is where Medicare Advantage might come in because it does help negate the need for supplemental health insurance. But there are limitations and rules to it. It may uh, include some prescription drug benefits, but that is where Part D comes in because it is the prescription drug coverage. There is supplemental Medicaid available for some older adults that meet certain financial needs. Uh, but if they don't qualify, they are left with that gap where they have to pay either the medical costs themselves or they have to have that supplemental insurance. And it can be pretty unreasonable prices for supplemental insurance. So really important for us to be aware of these economic impacts on our older adults. We do know that there, uh, the cost of health care is always increasing and it is a significant portion of what older adults may spend their finances on. So Obamacare is the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act that came about in 2010. It does provide numerous health-related provisions that take place over several years. Some of them have already taken place. However, there's a lot of controversy out there because the long-term effects are still unknown. And this includes expanded coverage or coverage of people that have those pre-existing medical conditions and decreasing the costs that are available for the older adults because it does cut Medicare funding <clears throat> and Medicare Advantage. It is a tax. Uh, so, you know, the funding for it on the government basis can be pretty significant. We also have to be aware of the costs and the end of life care. There's a lot of controversy out there, such as the different questions. <clears throat> Should the very ill or terminally ill, most of whom are going to be older adults, do we spend money on them using intensive, expensive interventions to extend their lives? We need to look at the financial issues because that forces those ethical concerns about how health care resources are allocated. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of advances in medical technology, but that does increase the cost. So do we continue increasing the age of our older adults through those advances? 
healthcare is geared towards saving people. So do we allow the very ill or terminally ill to die because of financial concerns? It's really important to be frank with clients and families about treatments and prognoses and help make sure that they have informed decisions about end of life care. This situation has really created a moral, ethical, and legal dilemma with <clears throat> no simple right answer. So let's look at some of those legal <clears throat> aspects, excuse me, related to aging. Clients should always have the right to make decisions regarding the amount and type of health care that they desire. And they should be made in a stress-free time when the client is cognizant of what's going on and they're not experiencing acute health issues. Those wishes need to be communicated through advanced directives so they're assured they have that comfort of knowing that their wishes will be followed if extreme circumstances should arise. And people, again, 18 years and older need to be considering this. They don't, they should not wait until end of life situations uh, come up. <clears throat> Excuse me. We're talking about DNR requests or different uh, directives that include mechanical ventilation or artificial nutrition and hydration. People need to discuss these wishes not only with their family members but also their health care providers. The two main types of advanced directives that are recognized in most states include the durable power of attorney. This is only in effect where when the client is unable to make decisions for him or herself, it allows someone else to make their health care decisions. So if they're unable to do it, then someone else is assigned. Usually it's a family member and sometimes a close friend. It is a document that specifies the client's wishes in writing and is witnessed by two unrelated individuals. And there are standardized forms that are available. We also have the living will, which provides information for care of non-curable diseases. It will go into effect when two physicians agree in writing that certain requirements have been met. <clears throat> Excuse me, it provides information on what the client refuses. You know, maybe they refuse CPR, or maybe they just want chest compressions, but they don't want medications. Or maybe they want medications and they don't want compressions. Maybe they don't want uh, to be on uh, life support. So it, it provides their, their wishes in these special situations. One or other Either the living will or the DNR are usually going to be, or not the DNR, but the durable power of attorney <coughs> are required, usually not both, but both can be used just to make sure there's no conflicts. Understand that these documents can be revoked or changed at any time. They don't have to, you know, once they're signed, they're not necessarily set in stone. They can always be changed. And then we have the physician's orders for life-sustaining treatment or the POLST. It is a doctor's order for emergency personnel. Regardless of the form that is completed, if one is completed, then it needs to be shared with family members, it needs to be shared with the healthcare provider, making sure that it is on the client's medical record so it is readily available. I will tell you, uh, for example, that my mother elected to go into a long-term care facility for some rehabilitation 
she did not have her uh, durable power of attorney with her at the time of admission. It was going to be provided at a later date and time. She ended up going into cardiac arrest that very same evening. The durable power of attorney was not available, so the healthcare facility was obligated to provide life saving treatment, even though we had the DPOAs, which was myself on the phone, and my sister, who was at my mother's side, right there telling them, you know. We don't want this life-saving treatment to continue. My mother does not want this life-saving treatment to continue. They had no option because they did not have the paper there, uh, that legal document telling them what mom's wishes were. So then we move on to self-neglect. This is an issue that we often see in the older adult it might be done to someone, but self-neglect is going to be a common issue among the older adult where the older adult is not taking appropriate care of themselves. It can be difficult for concerned parties to intervene until a situation becomes critical or life-threatening. It can be recognized by neighbors or family. It can be reported to the police or public health nurse or social worker. We often see it in the event of mental illness or dementia, maybe even just depression. It may require legal action to put the client in protective custody. Self-neglect is basically a failure to provide for themselves because of a lack of ability or lack of awareness. <clears throat> Indicators of self-neglect include that inability to take care of themselves or obtain adequate food or fluids. They may have poor hygiene, changes in mental function, an inability to manage their money, a failure to keep important appointments, or they may have undergo life-threatening or even suicidal acts. We look at different abuse situations. There's uh, a lot of situations where the older adult is being cared for by family members or even caregivers. And there's high levels of stress involved in attempting to meet the needs of these older adults. So there's an estimated 10% of adults over 65 that have suffered some form of abuse or are undergoing some form of abuse. This abuse can be intentional, where it's deliberately planned to mistreat or harm another person. It can be unintentional because the caregiver just doesn't have the appropriate knowledge or stamina or resources. We often see this where there's continuous needs for a client or the client is confused. We might see physical abuse, which would involve any action that causes physical pain or injury. It can include being locked in a room, uh, sexual abuse or rape, starvation, maybe being fed unsuitable food or being given inappropriate medications, whether it's dosage or the wrong medication or not being given medications when it's necessary, force feeding, restraints, punishment. Warning signs would be the bruising or laceration, fractures, burns, wounds, etc. Torn or bloody underwear a delay in seeking treatment, <clears throat> maybe they're doctor shopping. So they go to multiple, multiple doctors to prevent people from realizing that these issues are going on. Neglect is another type of abuse, which is a passive form. The caregiver fails to provide for the needs of the uh, older adult maybe intentionally, but it can also be unintentional. So they have a lack of hygiene or safety or a failure to provide medical care. 
Emotional abuse is also prevalent, such as isolating, ignoring, or depersonalizing the older adult. This damages the client's self-esteem and can destroy the will to live. Financial abuse is where the resources of the older adult are stolen or misused by a person that the older person trusts. It can be a family member, but it can also be a paid caregiver. And abandonment. This is where the uh, dependent older adult is deserted by someone who is responsible for taking care of them. This can leave the older adult physically, emotionally, and financially dependent. Uh, they're defenseless, and then they become wards of the state. Older adults respond very differently to abuse. They fear their fears of the treatment that they're receiving are far less than the fear of being institutionalized or abandoned. So they just do not seek help. They may even protect their abuser or deny that the abuse is occurring or maybe they're just resigned to the situation. Maybe in investigating these issues, we don't use the word abuse, but we use the word problem. Again, abuse can occur by unrelated caregivers that are hired to provide for the safety and well being of the adult. Those hours can be very long and it's very emotionally and physically demanding and the pay is not that high. You know, there's laws out there to prevent these issues, but people do slip through the cracks. And this can also uh, be found in some institutions, you know, some healthcare facilities. We as nurses are mandatory reporters, so if we suspect or we come across situations of abuse, we are required to report suspicions of abuse to the state. Uh, usually this uh, group is called Adult Protect Protective Services. It is against the law to fail to report suspected elder abuse. These reports are usually anonymous, but they should be based on solid evidence. If the older adult is believed to be in immediate danger, law enforcement needs to be notified. And once they are notified, notified they are obligated to investigate and pursue any legal action. And the Kansas Nurse Practice Act does provide immunity from liability in civil actions if we as nurses report it and we are um, reporting in good faith. You know, we have, have very reasonable concerns and belief that someone may be suffering incidences of malpractice or neglect or abuse, we should be protected by law uh, if we happen to be incorrect.